camera and making sure that he's going to be my little bouncer. If you're getting too rowdy, he'll help you find the door if you're unable to close it. Yeah. Um, this depth perception might be a little off. <laughs> I have um, Angie Wilson, who is a major individual, and she's actually relatively new to the cosplay and costuming, but she's also extremely entertaining, so if I get really, really boring, she's going to spice things up a little bit. And then we've got my special guest that did not my schedule is Katie Oten. She's actually my, my official model for my small business that I own and run, which is Purple Koi Designs. Um, my panels that I'm doing yeah, uh, will be eventually on my website. So if you went to the uh, Victorian slang, which I know is kind of boring, <laughs> um, but that's going to be online as well, as well as this one. And I had another panel that I ended up having to back out on, which was how to make your own physical venture journal. And that's going to eventually be up on that website as well. Um, so this is the use this, not, pa not that panel. And I'm Amy Lionheart. So the disclaimer is, is that uh, this presentation is extremely loosely inspired by Eat This, Not That educational format. If you are diehard of the book and you're like, this isn't really exactly like that format, well, who cares? <laughs> um, if you are very sensitive or easily offended, you may want to choose a different seat, uh, possibly in a different panel. Maybe you're hungry, you need to go out and grab a bite. Even though that you don't think this might be a, a very controversial panel, there are some things that I'm going to bring up that are very controversial. So you might not think so, but there will be. Um, the information. Ooh, suspense. <laughs> suspense, yes. Uh, the information, images, videos, which are not videos, so I apologize, are used under the U Fair Use Act for educational purposes. So I'm educating you. Deal with it. And all of these present uh, presentations will be made avail available with references eventually at purplecoydesigns.com. So why should you listen to me? Isn't she cute? <laughs> that was me when I was about, about four years old. I was mute. I did not speak a single word when I was young, when everyone else was learning how to speak and communicate and they wouldn't stop talking. I didn't say a single word. So my brain does not interpret language exactly the way that most other people do. It takes a lot longer for point A to go to point B. There's a nice little telephone system going on. And sometimes there's this one little cell or this little cell. They like to screw around with the game and put some extra words in there or spaces. So sometimes my pronunciation of common words are going to be way off. And sometimes I might not be able to sound like, did she just say this word or did she mean that word? Yes, that's actually what happened. So don't worry. It's just me. It's not you. It's OK. That's why she has the peanut gallery. We, we would yeah. help her if she starts speaking in tongues. Yeah, if, they, if I start speaking in tongues, they'll be like, uh, you need to start speaking English. So, taking to the panel is, yay! Um, I also did, a, I've done a lot of cosplaying. These are a number of different costumes that I've done myself and worn. I am not a model, I like to make things, I'm not really good at wearing them, and I have gained a lot of weight since then, so please don't judge. Um, I like to joke that I have like the Dexter uh, Laboratory, um, Dexter's Lab from the old cartoon, where he's always making things, and just when he's done, he's already making something else, and he never takes time to really appreciate what he just did. That's me. <laughs> so, a lot of these pictures are like, Okay, I'm done. Let's go to the next. Do the next thing. So a lot of these, my photos of my stuff is usually bad. I'm getting better. I've got a photographer that's coming out and helping me. <laughs> He's gonna do stuff for me. Um, not only am I into cosplay, but I also drag my family in. I've got my younger sister in her Totoro bus. If anyone knows about Totoro, and on top of that, this is made for ASEN. And if you know Anime Central's restrictions, it has to be six inches away from your body at any time. She wanted to make sure that her bus, if she had no riders on her bus, she can compact it to herself and she can expand it to have more people ride her bus with her. And to explain so, that, they would kind of come underneath the costume and just fill in. Yeah, so it was really great for Photoshop. And everyone's like, that looks really weird. Why didn't you make it like all these other different cat bus fashions? I'm like, because they didn't work with Asa and, and didn't work with her request and didn't work with that request. So, yeah. But anyways, the lights, uh, the eyes light up, open, close, the mouth opens and closes. Um, there's little vents, little thing on the top that changes to the names of whatnot. 
I've got uh, my younger brother is Alucard. The picture's dark and kind of freaky and weird, but he's freaky and weird. <laughs> and then I've got Victoria Helsing, which just coincident, okay? He he wanted to be a vampire, and I'm like, I really want to be Victoria, uh, uh, Sarah's Victoria. So that just ended up happening like that. Here, there he is with his Inuyasha costume and another one. Um, my family's gone to conventions for ages. I was trying to find a picture of me and my siblings in front of the original TARDIS in front of Gen Con, er, yeah, one of the first Gen Cons in the 80s. We don't know where that photo went, but it's entertaining. Um, that convention that I just showed was uh, ASA 2008, 2009. Nine. And unfortunately, I didn't get a lot of photos of my costume because I met my wonderful, soon to be, or my wonderful husband at that convention. And this is a picture of like one of the first nights here for me. We usually tell people we met each other at a convention. We don't talk about the anime convention part. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you should, later, it, it, you should be wary of the people you meet at conventions, yes. but she hasn't murdered me in my sleep yet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's us both cosplaying. So. And on top of that, I'm the daughter of a mad doctor, and this is his wonderful experience, uh, experiment on me. Can you see? I just lost a mind. No, that's actually an optical or uh, a scleral contact that he crammed in my eye just to see what it would look like for a theatrical or a uh, movie performance that someone else was working on. Actually, yeah, he was working on, but it ended up having issues. So, did you ever want to make a costume? Raise your hand if you've made a costume already. Raise your hand if you've never made a costume or prop or anything before. Raise your so, hand if you've paid someone else to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is gonna, my entire panel is gonna like stretch amongst all, everyone. So if you've been doing this for years and years and years, or if you're brand new and you've never even touched anything before, and you're like, I really wanna do something. So I'm gonna go over lots of do's and don'ts, and some things that are actually possibly gonna save your life. I kid you not, there's actually dangerous things that a lot of people are doing all the time, and they don't even realize that they're running a, a, a severe health risk. And uh, I want to get to those points too. So we're going to go over okay, tricks and question. techniques. Did you hold your questions to the very end, or is it like I really need to answer? Uh, okay. Okay. So these tricks and techniques um, <clears throat> can save you tons of time, and tons of money, and give you valuable skills and insight. But not always. Sometimes you need to spend a little bit more money. You need to spend a little bit more time. These are just different suggestions. And we're gonna not specifically go over how to specifically make items, but tricks and techniques of different materials and how the different materials work and thinking outside the box and all that whole nine yards. <clears throat> some, some of the pitfalls are due to the lack of knowledge that people have. Um, I'm gonna go into my Princess Mononoke story. This was the moment where I realized that the difference between someone who has really bad costume, like the kind that you see and you're like, oh god, that is such the worst costume ever. I can't imagine anyone making something worse than that, versus someone who's like making the awesome, best costume ever. Um, one year I cosplayed as Princess Mononoke, which she's a tribal woman. She's very awesome. She's got a wolf pelt on her back. I had spent tons of money on this costume, probably the best Princess Mononoke costume I could possibly think I've ever seen. I mean, I had like everything so perfect. And then I ended up getting a tag along in the middle of the convention, a guy who was cross-playing as Princess Mononoke. And his dress was made out of felt that he cat glued together. And he used this artificial lamb's fur that's like bald. And on top of that, he obviously was colorblind because the blue dress was bright purple. <laughs> and it was just an eyesore. And I'm like, if you're here, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're here, I don't see him anywhere. If you are here, I apologize. I, I thought about including a photo, but I'm like, no, no. With my luck, I'll throw that photo up there, and someone's going to be like, I know him, and then I'm going to get in trouble. So. Names will not be said. <laughs> but um, he was following me around this entire convention, and finally I was getting so fed up because it was like, really, you're, you're making my eyes bleed. I mean, I don't know how to describe this anymore. So finally, my politeness dissolved, and I had a snarky remark. I'm like, you know, if we were in a costume contest, 
between you and me, it would be a really hard decision. And all of a sudden he got really offended and my soft side just was like, oh no, I made him upset. So I'm like, well actually if you think about it, you know, if you had the same financial situation, you were able to put tons of money in this, you had the skills and the knowledge and the time, yeah, your costume would look just like mine. And then he felt a lot better about himself. And then I realized that's the pitfall that people have. They don't have that knowledge. They don't have that time. They don't have those skills. They don't have that MacGyver aspect, you know, of grabbing whatever's available to them. They just don't have that. So hopefully, when you leave this panel, you'll have a little bit of that. <laughs> um, so basically, instead of uh, learning to fish versus getting a fish, hopefully I'm going to teach you how to fish your, yourself versus just giving you freebies. Um, and also learning about the problems and figuring out solutions for them. So first we're going to go over fabrics because costumes are usually, nine times out of 99.95% of the time, they're made out of fabric. Um, so using my Princess Mononoke costume concept, you're going to want to use like a polyester blend. Most people love polyester blends, uh, the cotton polyester blends because they come in so many different like styles and whatnot. Um, they have a lot of varieties to choose from, lots of color, different patterns. Um, you're not going to want to use felt if you're not experienced with fabric. You might see it on the end panel somewhere and it's on sale and it's stiff and you're like, that'll work, it's on sale, it's the right color. Can you hold your questions to the very end? Okay, awesome. But there are certain circumstances in which felt can be used in costuming. So that with everything, instead of like saying you can never use this material, most of my stuff is there are purposes you can use it for, you just gotta really think outside the box. Um, understanding touch, I try my best to try to give the patterns of the fabrics because it's really hard to do that without handing out swatches of fabrics all over the place. Um, but canvas and duct, are usually a thicker, more durable uh, canvas um, that was a predecessor to denim. So they, instead of, when we used to have blue jeans, before blue jeans they used to have canvas, which was not as awesome. And actually, the real story is, is that the canvas was made out of tents and uh, miners were running through their pants too much. And finally they're like, hey, we need a pair of pants that are actually gonna work better. So the uh, local um, craftsman was like, okay, well, let's grab your, the tent material and make some pants out of that, and then we got canvas pants, and then that really quickly turned into uh, denim pants that we have nowadays. So if you didn't know that, that's where that comes from. Um, muslin is an um, inexpensive, lightweight fabric, commonly used in fashion designs to make uh, trial garments for preliminary fits. I'm probably going to go through these fabrics really, really quickly because there's a lot more things that I'd rather do um, or talk about. But spend lots and lots of time in a fabric store feeling, touching, seeing how things drape and whatnot. Um, so usually uh, if you see a muslin on sale and you're like, oh, I can make this into a costume, think about what your character would actually be wearing and not just think of purely 100% of what's on sale kind of concept. Um, talking about drape how the fabric lays and how it you know, lays across the body or about across whatever subject you're using. Um, it's usually a little bit thicker and more dense fabric, sometimes, not always. Um, and it's usually made to make professional suits and blazers and things like that. Broadcloth is often is a cotton or cotton blend, and it's usually used in, in quilting. A lot of people, especially very new people to costuming, they look at it and they think, oh, this is really great. And then they come home and they realize that, you know, after you wash it, it, it loses stiffness because usually they add a little bit of starch in with that material. And people that are brand new to costuming don't realize that. They don't understand the concept of starch. <laughs> so that's used in the, in the fabric material. So. That's something to keep in mind is, is that, um, especially with, with broadcloth, that drape is going to be different than in the store than at home. And some fabrics are more true than not. Another issue that I've run across that people have is lighting. Um, 
And I've run into this a couple times, and it drives me crazy, because you go to the store, and you're looking for a very, very specific shade of purple, a very specific shade of this or that, especially if you're a cosplayer, where you're really trying to make your character's costume exactly like the character is. Um, you have the, the fluorescent lights at the, the store, and then when you go home, you have like the more yellow bulbs, the more yellow lighting. And the colors look very different, and it drives you crazy. So when you go to the store, always be aware of what kind of lighting is going on, and <coughs> what kind of lighting is going to be at where you're going to present the costume. So if the costume is in a showroom, that, or you're going in and hanging out at the vendor room, and it's got neon lights all over the place, or um, the fluorescent lights all over the place, you know, it's okay. But if you're going to be presenting it in a warm lit room, um, then you're going to have some problems. Uh, tone and shade, sometimes you can't find the exact tone and shade of your costume. So you got to really understand if there's going to be what you want to um, compromise. Do you want to co compromise um, the shade, which is like the lightness or the darkness of it, or do you want to, are you going to compromise the tone? So, which is basically, is it more of a green hue, or is it more of a blue hue, or is it more of a you know, red hue? Those kind of aspects. And I put in the uh, color strips to kind of give you a mental image of all those vast varieties of different colors. <clears throat> because um, I personally, depending on what the variance is, sometimes you'll have two or three different colors to choose from. And then depending if, you know, is it really, really dark? Is, it, is the difference between the dark and the light more extreme? Or is the, the hue more extreme of difference? So you kind of have to pick and choose your battles sometimes. Um, this is a quick no-brainer. And I apologize for the photos not turning out the best. But um, some people really want velvet in their costume. Velvet is a very beautiful material. I love it. I, I like to sit there and go, Oh, I wish I could afford that. <laughs> um, but sometimes uh, there's a lot of other similar materials. Sometimes you can get velvet really cheap. Sometimes you, most of the time it's really expensive. Um, there's also um, velveteen, velour, stretch velvet. There's um, other costuming velvets as well that have that very similar feel and similar look, but a fraction of the cost. I've seen velvet material go up to about uh, $75 a yard. So if you really like velvet, I uh, uh, hope it's just something really, really small. Or you have lots of money to donate into this project. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so here I've got the actual velvet image, beautiful material. Um, it's a beautiful, it's a soft blush and plush and um, it's really great. Supposedly people make upholstery and drapes out of it. Um, usually you'll see it somewhere between $24 a yard to $65 a yard. I've seen it more, I've seen it less. Um, always keeping an eye out for sales. Number one thing that I like to tell people that are trying to make their own costume is plan way in advance, like a year in advance even. And then just keep an eye on sales. And then when you have the material in mind that you want, purchase it when it's on sale. Get coupons, whatever you need to do, and go that route. I highly I do not recommend paying full price for lots of materials when if you just wait a few weeks maybe, you can pay for half the price. Um, patterns with the brocade. Um, material, I, that's another material that I absolutely love. Um, though the, the patterns are, depending on where you go, they're a little bit more limited. It's also a denser fabric. It also drapes a little bit differently than uh, pattern silk and whatnot. So I love it. You usually see it a lot in uh, oriental clothing as well, but nowadays a lot of people are wearing you know, the brocade in uh, bodices and whatnot. Um, another alternative, if you're looking for something that's a little bit more flowy that has a lot of pattern, is uh, the printed silk. Um, just to give people ideas for people that are really new, there's different um, types of weave in fabric. Um, so the <laughs> the weave kind that really come to mind. There's the lace, which is very fine woven fabric. Um, I have seen people think of lace and think of this next one, which is uh, tulle. Tulle and lace, if you're not 
if you've never worked with fabric before, you'll think is the same thing. It, it really isn't. And everyone else who does work with it will think, oh, you use tool in that instead of lace. How pretty. So uh, tool, <laughs> I have seen that many times. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting way of using tool. <laughs> I bet it was on sale too, wasn't it? And it was really cheap, and the other stuff that you really liked was really expensive. Yeah. I know how that goes. It's okay. Next time, it'll be better. Trust me. Don't worry about it. Stepping stones. Sometimes you gotta shoot, pick your battles. Um, another one is burlap. Now, burlap is the, the ugly stepchild. No, <laughs> it really, really is. But it, it's an industrial uh, material. And if you know how to use it and the proper usages of it, it can really help a costume out. Um, but not necessarily as like a bodice piece or something like that, but like as a pouch or something of that sort. Really good for like the accessories concepts. And nowadays, we're very lucky that they now have burlap sack material made with patterns on it. I'm excited about that one. I first saw that, I'm like, really? Patterns on burlap? Oh, that's still kind of sad. <laughs> What a waste of color. Um, we'll do the Princess Leia story. Um, my unique experiences through uh, clays and resins. I love clays and resins. I love them so very much. Um, a long time ago, I decided I wanted to, when I had a really awesome body, um, I really wanted to do the Princess Leia costume, like the slave one, you know, the really sexy one, right? And. Um, I decided the only, the real only clay resin that I really knew of was the oven baked clay. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. So I made the costume out of the oven baked clay and I put it on and I'm like taking a step outside and all of a sudden crack, 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 crack. And it's like, I'm going back inside. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that was like, oh, let's just not speak of this for a while. <laughs> A few years later, I'm like, I really still want to make this costume. I really do. And so I finally decided, okay, I just found this new Crayola soft clay that air dries and it's lightweight and it's not going to crack on me. And I make my costume and it looks awesome and it looks really cool. And I take a few steps out and crack, 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 crack because of the fact that it couldn't handle any pressure. Again, no, it, it, it was very limited to amount. And on top of that, I discovered that it shrinks when it dries. <laughs> Which was good for some guys. <laughs> yeah, it was excellent for some people. But then it was like, now my patterns aren't matching up with what I thought was going to happen. Um, and then I finally eventually discovered resins. Resins, oh, oh resins are amazing. Because then you can make your thing out of clay make a mold and pour your resin in. Resins, depending on what kind of resin, you can paint them, you can machine them, they are hard, they are impact resistant. Oh my God, awesome. But by that time, I gained about 75 pounds and I'm like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> Maybe one day, but not right now. So the, the trick is, is to never stop testing, never stop trying and never stop exploring. I never gave up. I really wanted this costume and I wanted to do whatever it took, no matter if it took me five years or ten years, to finally go through all these different materials to make this one costume. So now I just need to fix this other material. <laughs> uh, so the first one that I was talking about was the sculpty clay, the, or the oven baked clay. Um, it resembles modeling clay. It's relatively easy to work with. You've got to really work it first. When you first get it out of the box, sometimes it's really rock hard, and you're like, how am I ever going to work with this? And you just need to really start kneading it, and just not give up, and eventually it's going to get soft enough. And now they've got a wonderful uh, additive that helps soften the clay even more, which when I first started, they didn't have. Um, but it really limits the size, um, because the oven bed clay, you can only get roughly about half an inch at most. Sometimes you can push it before you start needing to have like an armature and filler in there. And then even on that, if you're having like a large something or other and you start putting filler in it, it's not durable. So it's not going to be load bearing, it's not going to be impact resistance. If you have this figure that you've made that's really big and you've got a lot of filling in it, 
a towel inside and you drop it, well, I hope you have a lot of glue on you. Um, so it's it's not load resist, uh, it's not load bearing, but it's still a really great thing to work with. I really I keep boxes of this stuff at home. Like I've got three or four boxes, and I just go through them. Whenever they go on sale, just buy another box. My next experimental <laughs> clay that I was started playing with was the, the the Crayola air dry clay, which I'm sure there's other kinds of clay that are very similar. It's very soft and um, it's really really great for padding for like uh, costumes. So like if you've got shoulders and you want to have like a special molded uh, padding, it works really great for that. Just need to keep in mind that it does shrink a bit. So it's something to think about. So it is easy to manipulate to a degree. There's some tricks to it. Like if you start kneading it, it starts air drying relatively quickly. You don't really realize it until you start messing around with it a lot. And then you start realizing that the more you tool it, the more it kind of breaks apart. So you have to work really fast, even though that says, oh, it dries 24 hours. Well, the usability, I feel, is only like three minutes. So before you start having this, this texture issue that starts coming into play. Um, and again, you're limited to the size, because if you've got something really big, it takes 24 hours for a small object to dry all the way through. And if you get something really big, it's going to take a lot longer. And it'll start cracking. So. Not too much fun with that. And that one, you really can't put any filler in it because it shrinks and scary things happen. <laughs> um, someone mentioned I had to put this in. Uh, Oil-based modeling clay, like, you know, stop motion picture modeling clay. Um, it won't dry. Uh, it might stay in fabric. And I really can't think off of the top of my head of any kind of application or use of it for, um, for costuming. But I have seen people with clay stains on them thinking that modeling clay would work for their costume. And then they're like, I'm like, why is that like hot pink? And they're like, oh, I tried making this really awesome thing, but it kind of fell apart and it never dried at all. And I'm like, did you use this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, now what I really enjoy doing uh, is working with gray stuff and green stuff. That's really good on small scales, small intricate details. Um, there are two part polymers. Um, you can control the hardening, like how fast it cures, by how much um, one color, basically a, a, a curing part, and then the, the, the main part. And um, you can control how hard it also becomes at the very end. So if you want something that's a little bit more softer and pliable, you add more, uh, less, of the hard, less of the hardener. If you want something that dries real fast and is really hard, then you're going to want to use the uh, little more hardener for that. So it really holds fine detail. If you love making jewelry, you love making your own jewelry, try using this stuff instead of the oven baked cake clay. It is very amazing. I love it. The first time I tried using it, it drove me crazy because I didn't realize that you needed to use small wire armatures. And I tried making a horse, and yeah, my horse kept on dying on me every single time I was making it because I wasn't using any armature whatsoever with it. And I pretty much put the stuff aside for about a year, and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Um, I love this stuff. This is another thing that I loved uh, working with is the amazing molding, mold putty. It's a two-part polymer. It sets relatively pretty quickly, usually like within half an hour or 20 minutes. It's uh, very flexible. It's also food safe, so you can uh, put chocolate in it and make your own little chocolate figures that look like whatever you want it to look like. Um, and it holds fine detail as well. So it's food safe and it's, just, it's amazing material. Um, you can use the mold over and over and over again. And this is uh, from their website actually. Um, the, the amazing putty, the only place I've been able to find amazing putty specifically, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you stand, um, is from Hobby Lobby. And they sell it for $19. Now, once in a great while, I think maybe once a year it goes on sale. I'll print off a 40% off. Yes, yes, if, you, if you're able to go to their website, you can print off a 40% off coupon. Um, once in a while I'll run across that they don't have that that week, but if you wait the next week, they usually do. 
You know what's um, amazing about the company is uh, water resistant. What was that? No rubber. Yeah, it is water resistant. Yeah. So, so the the and the and the nice thing about the amazing the amazing putty that was just before is that um, if you are sensitive to, to things, you're not going to be sensitive to this. It's very hypoallergenic. I have I'm allergic to everything in the world, I swear, and I'm not allergic to that. Um, this, unfortunately, <laughs> it's latex. So, obviously, if you're latex sensitive or have allergies to latex, this is not going to be your thing. Um, I do have a bucket of that, and I've only used it like once or twice, and I'm like, well, I'm going to find a different application eventually for that. <laughs> um, you must apply very thin layers, one after the other. You need to let it dry. Sometimes you can use, the, to, to help the, the curing of it, you can use a heat gun and just sit there and then apply your next layer and then sit there with the hot heat gun again. Is that a soft, rubbery type mold? Yes, it's a very soft, light, light mold. It's very, very flexible. It's so flexible, in fact, that most of the stuff that you're going to need, you're actually going to have to use like some sort of support. So when you pour um, your resins into the mold, you have it supported. Otherwise, it's just going to flop everywhere. And that's why I prefer the Amazing Putty instead of this stuff because it's, this stuff is kind of, for me, it's a nightmare. <laughs> but I'm sure there's things you can do with it. So this is an example that I've done um, where the top one, uh, I don't know if people can see this way in the back, but this top one right here I made out of, um, of the oven baked clay. And here I used uh, the molding putty and then I followed up by pouring um, the amazing casting resin into the putty, uh, into the mold putty and created this high impact resistant flower that sits on the hip for a princess, uh, not a princess, for a unicorn costume, costume that Katie will be in some of these slides wearing. Um, so it was really nice because it was something that, you know, people are klutzy or they're clumsy. I didn't know if, you know, Katie was one of those kind of individuals or not. And when I make things, I want to make sure that if you drop it, if you hit something, it's not going to break because I'm sick and tired of things breaking on me. <laughs> so. Um, the Amazing Casting Resin is a two-part resin. Um, it turns opaque, so it turns white when it's finished. Um, it's very fast. Five minutes. Super fast. I mean, you can just pour it, and you can just watch it um, cure and pop it out. And sometimes if you pop it out at this particular moment, it's still somewhat soft, and you can manipulate it a little bit more before it fully hardens. And uh, I highly recommend if you're able to prime it right away, that's the best because after a while, like after 24 hours, then it becomes a little bit harder to paint, but you can um, drill it, saw it, cut it. It's amazing, I love this stuff. And on top of that, it's impact resistant, so I gotta love that. Anything with impact resistance, I, I'm a pushover for. What, um, what color is it? What color is it? Color color? Uh, it only comes in one, it, it comes in opaque, but you can add uh, just dyes to it to make it any color you want. Um, then we also have um, the clear resins. There's a couple of things that are out in the market. Uh, there's a, some of them are two part, actually most of them are two part. Well, I've seen some that are like you pour this in and you have a couple drops of this, this curing stuff that helps make it set faster, set period. Um, you have um, limited uh, post workability, so if you're looking for something that's clear and pretty, you can't sand it afterwards because then you then you kind of mar it up, and then you have to go try to do some a lot of processes to try to smooth it out. If you if you're trying to make something that doesn't have like the edges of the mold, that's kind of that's the difficult part. If you have lines from where where the molding is with the clear casting stuff you're going to have problems with that part section. Um, but it's nice because you can like put all sorts of stuff in it and you can make it look like all sorts of different things. Um, because you can put the, this example right here is just glitter. But I've seen people put like different types of dyes and different types of like uh, opacity and um, little materials that make it end up look mar like marble. So it's really interesting to see. Um, I personally, this is one of the things that I haven't really played around with a whole lot. Just enough to know that it can be a pain. <laughs> um, resins. I bet none of you have thought about using hot glue. This thing I just recently realized, and I love it. And then, then I found out online that I'm not the only person, but there are a few other people that discovered this too. 
instead of using like a, an expensive resin, if you're broke, <laughs> sometimes if you're a starving artist, um, this works out really, really well. It's a nice alternative. It cures fast, pretty fast. It just, you know, cools down. And you're ready to go. It's very flexible. So if you've got like a ray gun or a costume piece that's, you know, has form to it, you know, it's not just flat. Um, this actually will help mold right along the sides of it. So you don't have like, it doesn't look like you have a metal chunk that's been glued to this or a metal chunk that's been glued to that. It actually looks like it's actually a part of the material. Um, and it's it, also paintable. You melt that down and put it in your mold? Yeah, yeah, you just take the hot glue, you, you, the hot glue gun, you put the, the, hot, the hot glue stick in the hot glue gun and you squirt it into the mold. So that's all you do. And it, it works out beautifully almost every single time. And I don't have problems with air bubbles. Like with the other resins, you'll have a problem with air bubbles. But with hot glue, it's very rare for you to run into problems with air bubbles. And it still holds the detail. So, and on top of that, stuff that if you're really, really broke, you can get at the dollar store. Um, small story that goes along with hot glue is that one time, me and Mr. Hot Glue Gun were not happy friends. In fact, um, the original hot glues were very hot. They were like industrial heat. And, um, I decided I was going to make, you know, my own little creatures by taking apart toys and putting them together and I was going to use hot glue for them. And I covered a teddy bear head with hot glue and then all of a sudden someone bumped me and it went flying. And my first instinct was, oh my god, it's going to land on my mother's carpet and she's going to kill me, i got to catch it. And of course, because the glue was heavier, it landed face down. And I was in so much pain. I literally felt like my entire hand was covered in hot glue. I couldn't even feel the finger that it landed on. It was in that much pain. Finally, we were able to get everything cleaned up, and I had a very, very bad burn. And my mom decided, okay, well, we don't have health insurance, but it's okay. It's not that bad. We'll just bandage it up, put a little bit of Neosporin on it, start getting really big blisters. and Not all my flesh was there, but that's okay. That's okay. Three months later, everything was still really bad, and it turned out that I was allergic to Neosporin. <laughs> so, <laughs> yay! And cortisone cream. Um, so now we're going to go into the state safety. This is part of the thing that most people don't realize. Um, my wonderful spray paint story. I used to use spray paint all the time. I would make sure that I was outdoors, or if I had the windows open, I had fans blowing, and I had like everything covered. I'm like, I'm, I'm set, you know, it's okay. I'm good, you know. Spray pay warning, it can make it cause cancer. Psh, it's California, they always say everything causes cancer. So I started using spray paint, like whenever I possibly could, because it was easy, it was cheap, it was, you know, there. I didn't have to think about it. And um, one day before, just two weeks or a week before my wedding, or actually my marriage ceremony, um, all of a sudden, my face broke out micro blisters. Extremely, extremely painful. It was like feeling my skin being ripped from my body. And there was nothing I could do because I was allergic to neosporin. I was allergic to cardamom. There was nothing the doctors could do because there was nothing that they could put on my skin to make the pain go away. And it was so excruciating. For about two years, or a year or so, I didn't know what I was allergic to. I just knew that if some, whatever it was, it was really bad. And then one day I realized, out of sheer coincidence, that I was severely, developed a severe allergic reaction to spray paint. And then I realized, oh my god, if I'm having this reaction now, and every single time I'm subjected to anything that's even remotely like spray paint, my reaction <laughs> keeps on getting worse. Keeps on getting worse. Now it's to the point where it's like, if I have a reaction, I don't know if I'm going to be able to survive it. So I know there's a spray paint panel coming up soon somewhere. And I'm like, oh dear God, I really hope they're just talking about it and they're not actually doing it because that would be really bad. Plus it's indoors, so that would be really bad for everyone else. But spray paint is something that a lot of people don't realize the actual dangers for it. It is very toxic. You should not be breathing it in. Even if you're in a well-ventilated area, like I was, you're still going to develop issues along the way. And even if you've never met anyone who's ever had a reaction, now you have. And I'm pretty sure that there's even more people that have 
develop lung cancer and cancers from it and other problems and health problems because of it. So I'm going to tell you what to do instead of using spray paint, but you should, if you have spray paint, you just should get rid of it because it's a uh, health hazard. Kids abuse it, you know, it's liability. If kids grab your spray paint and they start tagging houses and whatnot, then you you can possibly be potentially liable because they got it from you. Um, so there's no reason, except for a very small percentage of reasons, that you should ever have spray paint, ever. So we're going to go over some non-toxic and safe practices based off of my experience. Yes, I have maimed myself so you guys can learn from my mistakes. Um, first thing is, it's hard to see, but there's this cute little black cat here, adorably fuzzy, and he is playing D&D. <laughs> that is my cat. He plays Dungeons and Dragons. Does he win? We have taught him to roll the d20. He posited. it. Yeah. yeah, it's really this cat. Is, this cat needs to like has to have his brain examined. I mean, like if he passes away, we should like just donate him to science or something like that. This cat is bizarre <laughs> in so many ways. But his name is Nightshade. He's adorable. We're gonna play a cute little game. What has Nightshade never been caught drinking? Scotch. <laughs> Do you think he's never been caught drinking latex wall paint? How about bleach? No. How about dirty paint brush water? No. How about alcohol? No. How about tea? No. Any, any guesses between uh, all of them? All of them. Bleach. Give that there. He has never drinking tea. That's him with a six pack. No, he did not drink the six or the twelve pack. Okay. Yeah, you no, oh, use the tea. Here, here, here's two. Eight. Oh. Woo. So yeah, so he's never been caught drinking tea. Which means I have caught him drinking all of those. I have caught him when I was painting a wall. I turned around, not thinking you think a cat would drink paint out of a big gallon paint jug that reeks? Oh, yes. heck no, he drank it. I'm like, look around, I'm like, that is not milk. What is your problem? <laughs> uh, one time I was dumping bleach into a bucket because I was going to bleach some stuff. And I'm pouring, and he comes up and he's like watching me. And I'm like, oh, how cute. You're watching mommy do, you know, household chores. And all of a sudden, he starts drinking out of the stream that I'm pouring, and it takes me a full second to realize what is happening. Because my brain cannot comprehend anyone willingly drink bleach. Um, how do you like it? He loves it, unfortunately. And I'm like, no, I need to like keep him out of the room because he's like, you're, you're something is crossed in that cat. Um, he's also drinking paintbrush water. He loves doing that so much to the point where it's like I have to put a separate cup where at my workstation because I also do paintings and whatnot. I have to put a separate cup there so he doesn't drink out of my thing because he'll still try drinking out of my stuff. And that, he is also another reason why I don't use toxic paints. I have to use everything that's non-toxic because of the fact that I understand that my cat will probably try to consume it. Like bleach? Like bleach. <laughs> well, bleach is not non-toxic, but, you know, whenever I can have a non-toxic alternative, I go with that. And the idea is, is that you might have little kids at home or know someone who has little kids or maybe have a little nephew or someone that comes over and you might think, oh, they're not going to eat or consume any of these uh, things. Oh, they'll put everything in, your, in their mouth. He, he'll, he'll put anything in his mouth, and he's just a cat. Think what a kid does, and they're always touching electric sockets. And I've also caught him drinking alcohol. Yes, he, I caught him drinking beer, I caught him drinking vodka, and it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you always tell the family that comes over and visit, you know, if you have a little kid, oh, make sure you cover your glasses, because little, little Timmy's at that curious age where he's drinking things. No, you gotta cover your glasses, because my cat will drink. <laughs> I have interesting parties. So there is Katie with her wonderful you know, costume right here. And um, the understanding safety is the airbrush. It's non-toxic most of the time, depending on what kind of paints you get. It's safe. It's, it might be an expensive startup, but if you're looking for you know, saving some money, you can get some, like a set. It's really cheap on sale for like 100 bucks. It's a great, amazing investment. It's my goal to try to get everyone to have one of these eventually in their house and toss out spray paint altogether. Because with this, you have so many different options you can work with. 
This is a top down fed, and this is a bottom feeder right here. Um, so what happens is you've got the pump, and there's a lot of different types of pumps and brands. Like some say that this is for makeup, and this is for food and cake decorating, and this is for paint, and the, this is for nails. They all work out of the same system, really. The difference is basically the nozzle areas, and whether it's the top down or bottom feeder, sometimes some have a very fine detail for the nails, larger detail or larger expressions for larger objects. Um, you also have more brush control as well. So not only when you, most things are dual control, so you can push down and it gives you more paint. You pull back, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> push down more air. Pull yeah, more yes, paint. thank you. Obviously, it's been about a year. <laughs> uh, actually, no, it hasn't been a year. It's only been six months because I made this this spring. Um, but, you know, you can control how much air you have and how much paint you have. You how far the needle goes in and out to allow the paint to flow, and you allow pushing down yeah. to adjust the amount of air that comes out and out to yes. push the paint. Yep. And, and those, I, I recommend the most. And you don't get that feature with spray paints. You really don't. You don't have that control, and you don't have all these different options either. So you, you so uh, you can just have <laughs> you can have just a you you can use the same compressor and the same hose, but use a different um, tool for the food products or the nails or the makeup or whatever you want. You just have a separate one for those. But you know you can't do that with a spray paint can. You can't spray your face, you can't spray your cake, you can't spray your nails. Well, I'm sure there's a group of people that spray their nails, but I have done that, but only on accident, and I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, so, and, and it's also less expensive to replenish. So, I mean, sometimes you can get small amounts, and it's not going to cost you as much for an entire large can or whatnot. Yes? Okay, I belong to the International Plastic Modeler Society. We do a lot of plastic modeling, and the only way that we recommend painting is with the, the airbrush. The beautiful thing about this is when you go to paint, if you turn your air pressure down and you get a fine enough coat of paint, you can paint in very thin coats. Mm -hmm. You can paint to a point where whatever you've got under it shows through the paint, so you can bury it. You can change shades, hues, everything. You, a monotone of color doesn't look natural, but you can change the variations and everything, and you can do, you can accomplish some beautiful things. And the other thing of this, is when you get done, you can put a dog coat over it, you can put a sheen coat over it, you can put a yeah. polish coat over everything else, and then when you get done, all of your using and handling doesn't wear your coat off, doesn't, doesn't wear paint off, so it doesn't show the wear. It's beautiful. Airbrush is the only way to do anything. Yeah, yeah, I, I highly, I highly agree that I, I. That's why I say I think every single person should get one of these, whether or not you're an artist or not, just as an alternative to, to spray paint. And also, um, I used a uh, here I used an, an a paint that acts like a uh, fabric dye, and um, basically, and it's designed to work with fabric. So instead of sitting there and trying to make a good grade of Dark or darker pink to the, the cream white, I could just use the, the, the airbrush to do it. And that's an excellent, excellent way of, of doing that project. Uh, which one's better, the top or the bottom? Or Depends on what you're doing. If you're planning out, if you're an individual that does a lot of one color at a time or really big things, so you can do the bottom feeder. Um, if you're doing a lot of changing from one color to the next color to the next color, you're going to want to use the top down because you could just put as much or a few drops on the top and spray it out, but if you have just one color, you can squirt it on the, in the bottom in a larger jug and just go with it for a long time. So I want to hold off on more questions so I can get the rest of the thing through. No, I'm just going to get some information. The reason the top feed is the best, the one thing you have to know about an airbrush to keep it working great all the time is whenever you use an airbrush, you have to clean it. You cannot ever set that thing down for half an hour or an hour and do something else in the back. So every time you run paint through it, you run cleaner through it immediately after. You change colors, you run cleaner through it. The beautiful thing about that top one is, you have the cleaner there, you run your paint through it. As soon as you're done, you run the cleaner through it, and you're done. That's what the beautiful thing is. The other thing of it is, whenever you use a top feed, 
It takes less air, air pressure to push that paint out because you don't have to suck the paint up and then blow it up. It's blow I've got a lot of slides to go through, I'm sorry. But okay. you, there's a lot of instructions that there's you can go online and learn more Top's about it. Better. So with the spray paint, um, you run the risk of it's toxic. It can cause cancer. It can cause death. There's a lot of abuse that has been going on in the past. I don't know if teenagers are doing it anymore or not, but it's been an issue in the past. Um, a lot of people think, oh, it's cheap, I only need one color, but you know, if you're doing a lot of stuff, like I was, I had a couple, not just one, a couple of banker boxes full to the brim with spray paints. Um, and you do have a limited control and a limited use, you can only use it on certain materials. Of course, there's a panel that's going to go over um, different types of uses and how to use spray paint in all these different ways. You can probably do almost everything that they're going to talk about with an airbrush. Um, understanding sta safety with the uh, styrofoam company. It's green. A lot of people think of styrofoam and they think about the white stuff. That has been like the Kleenex. So this is nicknamed styrofoam, kind of like all facial tissues are nicknamed Kleenex. But this is actually not, you know, the styrofoam copyrighted name. It is this green block right here. Um, I still think they still have this design where it's a, a yellow and pink flower and it says like the styrofoam company or something of that sort. It is non-toxic, it is safe, it is it's one of the few things that it's safe to actually melt. They have tools that are designed to help melt and shape these forms and it's stiff and it's sturdy and it's a lot more durable than a lot of other things out there. And when I first ran across this, I was thinking, oh my god, this is my, my, my savior, because a lot of other things that are out there, when you burn it, it releases a very toxic fume. You do not want to be breathing that in. People are like, oh, well, it's only this one time. I'm like, yeah, it's this one time this year. What about the next time? Or what about, you know, you're walking down a hallway and someone else is working on a project that is also releasing toxins. And you're first subjected to so much toxins that it, it adds up really, really fast. And now I personally am allergic to so many different things, and I'm pretty sure it's because of all the different things that I've used. Um, this head, which is huge, is made out of um, the, gr uh, the green styrofoam, and also her uni unicostume's uh, top scepter air section is also made out of that green stuff, or the, the green styrofoam. The stuff that you really don't want to you want to stay away from is uh, the white styrofoam, like the styrofoam cups, packing nuts and things like that. Um, it's toxic. It can ca cause cancer. It can cause death. It's cheap. It's easy to like grab a hold of. It's you can get it almost anywhere. Um, it's static clings to everything all the time. It just drives you crazy. Um, here I've got someone who managed to make a couch out of the stuff, which I give you know props to doing so, but I'm pretty sure that he's not doing, uh, he's probably taking a few years off of his life just making that. And the number one thing is, is that you shouldn't remove the years of your life off of what you love to do. And if you start using all these chemicals that I've done, I'm pretty sure I've probably knocked a few years off of my life because I've been breathing pain. Because I've been, had been using styrofoam because I had been melting plastic. And everyone's like, oh, you, sh you really shouldn't do that. I'm like, well, it's in a ventilated area. Well, even in a highly ventilated area, you're still breathing things in. And that's something that they never really, really tell you is that you should just not do it because they want to make money. I mean, they, they, when it comes down to it, that's, that's, the, that's the whole issue. Um, paint washes versus stains. Um, this is one section that I'm still kind of bad at. Um, paint washes is just basically taking water down paint, painting wood, coloring wood. Um, it's safe, it can be, depending on what kind of paint you are using, but it's a more safe option. It's not toxic most of the time, depending on your paint. Um, it changes the color of the wood, it's cheap, it's watered down. It's not color fast, it can fade over time. Sometimes you have to reapply the paint, but it's also, depending on the paint what you're using, it's easy cleanup. Soap and water. My favorite is this uh, Verathene wood stain. That is my dirty little secret right there. <laughs> um, it is toxic, it has bright colors, it is longer lasting color, and it can be harder to clean up. Usually everything that I'm working with, I just, is disposable. That's the one thing I, I just, I don't want to deal with it. I do it outside, 
I try to do it as fast as I can, and if I've got a lot of projects to do, do it all at once and hope to God that try not to breathe too much. Uh, but you come up with such beautiful colors, and um, you just paint washes just don't do the same for me. Twenty minute warning. What was it? Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Okay, awesome. Oh, melting plastics is um, it's toxic again. Um, you can use and reshape the forms using the toxic plastics, and you can also uh, use different types of plastics to also cut into forms. So I've got a couple examples. We've got a really awesome craft that someone came up with. Oh, this is a great idea, right? Um, take like little pony beads, put them on the bottom of a cup, and put it in the oven. Great idea. Let's have all the family join in on that project. But look it, you've got really awesome wind check catchers. Some of the same thing with Legos, and they made a giant lamp uh, lampshade using Legos. I'm pretty sure that probably knocked a few years off their life, too. Here we've got, for one reason or another, someone's decided to melt a spoon over a candle to make some sort of project. And then we've got a guy that's using some tools. I actually have this multi-purpose tool at home. And he's just planning on cutting this thing and reshaping it. Um, sometimes you want to make a visor, like a clear visor. Um, what you do is you take a hot heating gun and you can heat up the plastic and the, the, the acrylic or whatever material and it'll bend. Problem is, is that that's another thing that's going to take a couple of years off your life because it releases a lot of toxins. And it is very, very strong smelling and it's going to take a while to get that smell out of the house and out of your nose. Um, so it's, a, it's the only thing I know of that you can really do. Um, besides making a mold and a form and pouring the clear resin in it, is taking pre-existing panes of uh, uh, polycarbonate and things like that and heating them up. Uh, some dangerous parts, you, when you make a costume, remember the dangerous parts of your costume. <laughs> um, blades, spikes, sharp edges, projectiles, glass. Some people make, a, I've seen a lot of people make really dangerous costumes and they're not thinking about it because they want, they're thinking accuracy. <laughs> And they're not thinking about everyone else at the convention with them. And I've seen a lot of people get really upset because they can't wear their costume at Anime Central because, well, you're walking around with like 20 different spikes sticking out like three inches everywhere, six inches, and you're going to kill someone. You just, no. You just think about it and think of alternatives. A card stock, we're going to go through some wood fibers. It's cheap. Temporary, it's thin, but it's still thicker than paper, right? Um, and but the projects that you would really use it for is for very small and flat objects like a deck of cards that you want to make yourself or whatnot. Someone made a little basket here, so it's an alternative. It's inexpensive, but you're very limited to what you can do with the cards uh, with the card stock. Um, I think I skipped it. No. Corrugated cardboard, I think corrugated cardboard, it is a nightmare. I usually highly recommend people choosing something else other than corrugated cardboard, but you, you can do certain things with it, but you have to remember that um, it has those lines with ridges in it. And corrugated cardboard, it almost always is gonna look like corrugated cardboard. If you spray paint it or if you add duct tape to it, it's, it's gonna look like duct tape cardboard. Um, and it's not very convincing, you're not really gonna fool anyone. Unless you're really thinking outside the box like this guy did, yeah. it's you're 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 really pushing it. Um, an alternative to corrugated cardboard would be press board or chipboard. Um, <clears throat> that is a pain to work with just because it's so stiff. It it, it works very well because it's more durable. It's but it's harder to manipulate. But it's still sturdy if you get it wet, like if you're painting it. Um, you do run the risk that it's probably going to warp a bit because what happens is the upper layers start absorbing the wet paint. Bottom layers are not absorbing it as fast, so you're getting a bending effect. So that's something to keep in mind. Sometimes you can cure that by throwing a couple of really heavy dictionaries on top of it. But, but um, this is also the material that you usually see at the back of like a writing pad kind of thing. But I've seen some that are like oh, a quarter of an inch to a half an inch thick. So it can get, those materials can get pretty thick and pretty durable. The other alternative is wood, actually hard, hardwood, uh, softwood. Um, it's heavy, it's hard, 
Um, it's solid, it's durable. But the downside, the downside, is that it requires tools and skills. So if you don't have any tools, you don't have any skills, well, you know, there's a Menards down the road and get started. You know, you gotta start somewhere. So I tried to show like a really interesting use of someone uh, using the wood and creating something that doesn't look hard. So it can be manipulated, you just really need to think outside the box. Uh, so, firearms. Yay! Replicas. Real versus fake. Um, this guy's mine, right up here, I know him. The other two, I didn't. Um, this part is part of that uh, resin that I've talked about, the hot glue. It's actually hot glue that I used. Um, when you're using wearing costumes that have dangerous um, aspects to it, props and whatnot, you really want to make sure that I highly recommend using artificial props, the, the fake stuff. Just because, you know, with the fake stuff, it, you're not going to worry about a misfire. If you are, it's not going to kill anyone. Um, usually, not always, they're, they're lightweight. There's some that are out there that are freaking heavy. Um, you should be able to carry it anywhere. No one's going to stop you and say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't bring that in here. It's against the law. It's also, not always, but sometimes less expensive. And you can um, actually use it, display it, stand up and, you know, take a shot or whatnot for photos and whatnot. Um, so, to make you understand that I am not a person that really hates guns, I enjoy it. This is Ian from Top Shots from the first episode, and this is me. And I'm like all excited and um, learning some tips from him. So, I do enjoy firearms. Uh, it really, the, the aesthetics with wearing like an actual sidearm or a firearm with your costume modified, um, the idea is that, you know, it's fashion meets function. Now Wisconsin has the conceal and carry law, you can wear it. Um, it has that like striking fear like, oh, well that guy really has an actual six shooter, that's impressive. Um, but you have a lot of extra responsibilities. It's lethal. You are carrying a lethal weapon on you. I'm not going to lie. It's lethal. You can kill someone. Or someone can kill someone else. And you're liable. You will go to jail. I'm sorry. It's going to happen. Um, you also want to make sure that when you're wearing your costume, you want to know your surroundings. Because there are some people that are going to grab your part, your, your props. It doesn't happen very often. But once in a while, someone's going to steal your prop. If you're cosplaying long enough, it, and your costume's good enough, it's going to happen. Um, and if it turns out that the gun that they just stole actually was a functioning real gun, yeah, you're going to have some issues. Also, you want to make sure that if you do, you want to make sure that you're fully educated about your firearm. You think of this is gun safety. You really want to take it seriously. Um, and you have to understand the law. You can't bring it anywhere. Like this hotel, you are not allowed to bring firearms into this hotel. So you can't, obviously, it's been stated, you can't wear, you can't bring them here. A couple weeks ago I was at a, uh, another little get together, a little convention, mini convention, and there were people that actually did have steampunk themed functioning firearms that they were carrying around with them. Because at that location it was not illegal, and a lot of people were like, oh that's right, it's concealed carry laws and legalized, so they can legally carry a real functioning firearm wherever they want to go. So, that's my two cents, is that just because you can doesn't mean you should. And on top of that with costuming, you don't want to get real life and make-believe mixed up. Especially when it comes to people's lives at risk. A lot of people are like, oh, but you know, conceal and carry, I never leave with, without it nowadays. It's like, you're, you should, you really should. I, I, who, do I, who am I supposed to say? It's just my panel, so you just gotta listen to me for a little while. Um, 15 minutes? Okay. So, go with LARPing weapons. Again, similar concept. You want to go with something that's going to be lightweight, soft, friendly. If you swing it, you're not going to kill anyone. I've seen way too many people with real ones that have no training whatsoever. Most people, even most people that even own swords, they have no training. I saw a one, um, I was actually in a costume contest, and one of the reasons why I don't do costume contests anymore, because I'm just worked out with them, was that a guy had bought his costume, and tried to play it off as he made it himself. He had a sword, and as part of his stick, he jumped on stage and drew his sword right at, at the thing, and then he tripped, but luckily he caught himself. 
and I freaked out, and some of the other people freaked out. Most of the other people thought it was just part of the show, and I'm like, oh really? So, yeah, don't go with the real genuine thing, it's just not worth it, I think. There are a few things more frightening than a room full of teenagers with brittle sharpened metal. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. So, with fake animals, you want to look at uh, cr they're cruelty free, they're easy to, uh, uh, to get a hold of, the prices reflect the quality, there's no special tools in general to be required to work with non real animal parts, and usually the, like, things like claws already come with their pre drilled holes. Um, if you do go with real animal, do a lot of research. One time I did, with my Princess Mononoke costume, I did use real animal. And I spent six months researching to make sure that I found a place that actually farmed the animals, took care of the animals, cared for the animal, made sure that the animals had lived at least a, a much larger chunk of their life before they would humanely put them down to harvest. Um, Think of more like if you eat hamburgers and burgers, these animals probably took a much better life than, than most, most cattle did. Um, but you have to understand that it is lethal. You are killing something. Um, and to this day, I always keep my mind about the little critter that, the critters that you know, sacrificed. I did not use real wolf pelts because I could not get myself to commit to doing that because I love wolves but I got arctic fox pelts, which are more considered ruined by most people anyways. But it still was taking life. Um, you do need special, special tools required, and if you're looking for something that's really high quality and takes good care of the animals, you're gonna cost a lot, like five times more than the average pelt would. Um, anything, uh, artificial metals, you know, basically painting things to look like plastics, um, <coughs> they really just make anything look like plastic. It's less expensive. There's me in a chain mail. It's really heavy. Um, if you're using real metal, it's more realistic. It makes wonderful noises, as we're all learning right now. Um, but it's also hard to manipulate, and you need special tools and some skills. Um, thinking outside the box, um, always invest in spools of wire. Wire can be manipulated into all sorts of things. Um, sewing shortcuts, if you don't know how to sew, a good starter, possibly stitch witch until you can afford to buy your own sewing machine. Don't go crazy with it, but you know, try to think of other costumes that might not require as much sewing. <laughs> um, use pre-existing materials, pre-existing costume parts, you know, things of that sort. Uh, don't be afraid to do clothing modifications, especially if you're new. Um, also bring emergency repair kits, like sewing needles and things like that. Find a way to mix it in with your costume somehow, so that if someone has a little foop out with their costume, you can fix it right away. Um, this is a mask that I made. It's a wolf mask. It's two part, attaches to the jaw, attaches to the head, and you talk, it talks. Um, so some things you can fix with masks and some things you can fix with makeup. And trying to learn the difference between the two is an adventure of yourself because um, there's so many different variations. You're going to get something that looks different for each of those. And then using foam instead of paper mache, with this guy I used foam. Foam is lightweight. It's um, more flex. It can be more flexible depending on what kind of foam you get. Um, I'm talking about the green not the green hard foam, but like the padding foam that's made out of what like, chairs are made out of. And you can like work that around your body in certain ways and, and glue them. And you can put fabric over that, or in this case, fur over that to make what you want. This is um, <laughs> real quick. Great stuff. Um, is really awesome also for padding. It comes in a bottle. It's used in the hardware store for filling in gaps. They have got two different versions. They've got one that's a hard version that basically gets hard. And then they've got one that's, say, soft and pliable. And both of them, depending on what you want to use for your armor, would work really great. And it's an alternative. Um, aluminum tape versus like using duct tape, it's also in an industrial usage. Um, but it's basically a sheet of aluminum that has glue on the back and it's, it's like duct tape, only it's actual metal. Um, don't forget to give yourself pockets whenever you're making costumes, because for some reason or another, people forget that a lot. And also, 
Reduce, reuse, and recycle whenever you can. Um, uh, be careful when you're buying theatrical contacts. You should really buy them from your eye doctor because what people don't realize is that everyone's eyes are shaped differently and contacts only have certain shapes. And if you're wearing the wrong shape over your eye, you can get blisters on your eye. Blisters on your feet are one thing, blisters on your eye are the other. My dad's an eye doctor, so yes, it is not fun. So that's also another reason why they say don't share your contacts with your friends. It's not because, oh, they're not just in your prescription, it's because you can actually damage the front of your eye because that curvature is uh, not working right. Yeah, so summary. Any questions? I'm sure there's plenty of them. So I'll start with you. Uh, you talked about theatrical. And I was at a con this last summer, and they, they sold all these, the, oh, thank you, all these theatrical contacts and for all these different effects. And the first thing I thought was, oh my God, what is this going to do to my eyes? Yeah. Uh, it, but if I go to my eye doctor, can he sell me this same special theatrical sort of, like the, the cat eyes and the vampire eyes? Actually, and, surprisingly, most of them do. My, um, I don't know. And, and how do I know where to go? There's a website, um, I think it's FX, that yeah. does yeah. the contacts for the movies and stuff. Yeah. You can also call around and ask your local optometrist, does anybody carry theatrical contacts or can you get a hold of theatrical contacts? Can you can order and, and yeah. Walmart doesn't exist much. Or, uh, sorry, Halloween. Yes. Uh, more of a safety comment, you're talking about paper, cardboard, um, chipboard. Yeah. That's fine if you're in an environment like this, a convention like this, but if you're going to like a Civil War reenactment, Red yes. Fair stop, that where there might very well be open flames, I would really think about that. Yes, yes, that's very true. Like, Ace, and you're not going to have that problem. Yes. Uh, a continuation with that, since I am a Civil War reenactor, be very careful with the fiber content of your fabrics if you're going to be doing something like that. Yeah. Polyester does not breathe, melts readily, looks like polyester. Yeah. I, we had a had an actual accident where the where a cannon went off prematurely and the guys were wearing polyester coats and it actually melted to their skin. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, you um it, this is all about the cat bus. Yes. <laughs> was it taken to Ohio Con in Columbus? No, it's only been at no Anime Central. And that was oh. only this year. I just made that this year. Okay, because I, I saw one about three years ago and I thought I was going to say, cool. wow, it was really, really super cool. No, thank that was amazing. Thank you for the compliment. Anyways, yes, you were. A question about the um, dyes, adding the dyes to the casting resin. What yeah. kind of dyes are you using? Um, the dyes are the dyes are the dyes are the what kind of dyes are you using? Um, if you go, I know in Hobby Lobby, at least. I know I have like all these different stores mapped up in my brain, it's kind of ridiculous. But if you go to Hobby Lobby and you go in the section that has the resins, like the, the two different the polymer resins or whatnot, right above the, the, the tray that has them, they'll have rack and they'll have dyes right there. Uh, on your painting, you were talking about the airbrush. The only reason the airbrushes are non-toxic is if you're using acrylic water-based paint. If yes. you're using other paints that have got a different there, but don't yeah. you use a respirator? Yes, I have used respirators before. See, I don't do it. But, but, not, but I only use non-toxic. Oh, no. And I, I think I've almost always used non-toxic. But on to you. Um, so with the, the airbrush, OK, so you can buy um, spray paint that has like metallic effects. They have like the, the flex yes, in it. Can yes. Can you do that with the airbrush? With the airbrush, the, the very small percentage where you can have problems, but there are paints that you can use with the airbrush that do very similar effects, almost exactly. But it's one of those things where I know I know what you're talking about. There, there are some that have like that that spatter stuff in it with all these different materials. And that's you you're going to have to use a different technique, which basically you add like different kinds of paint to a paintbrush. You just brush or a toothbrush, and you just bring your thumb back against the toothbrush, and it's going to give that similar okay. paint splatter effect. So that's a good way to get around it. I loved that until I found out there was an underneath uh, allergic to spray paint. And that was the thing that broke my heart was I couldn't use that particular spray paint anymore. Yes? One thing from experience when you are going to that you are bringing in costumes that you have to use tools to make. Make sure you bring every tool that you use to make. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah. you go and realize, oh, fudge, that fell apart in the car. Yes. And also yep. bring spare parts. Yes. So you will eventually be fixing it at the convention between the time that you get there and the time that you're on stage. Yep. So you can for it. And so I'm with, yes, I wanted to extend on the safety concept sure. as a public safety specialist in the chemistry industry. Yes. Um, well, ventilated really means something is wrong the airway from you. It does not mean open room. Uh, yes. If you, because people are going to use things they shouldn't, a respirator, you need to make sure it's rated for what you're using mm -hmm. and for the quantity ratio that you're using it for. Yep. So mm -hmm. just because you're using a safety tool doesn't mean that is 100%. <coughs> yeah. So learn about it before you use it. Yes. It's Definitely. Any other questions? I have, one more. <coughs> I have a comment. Yes. And that is, uh, as I have a friend here that's working security for the company, and even as many people have found out, even if it's a toy gun, if it's a convincing looking toy gun, yes. the police still want an orange tip on it. Yes. And I just happen to have a supply of orange paint <laughs> and paint brushes. If you run afoul of the authority. Yep. And uh, also Dremel tools, I love to use leather and brass, but when you have to, there's now a large six inch gash on me leg. I was making this out of brass, and the gent that gave the last talk on working with brass pointed that out. And there's, when it says it's a high, it's small, but it turns into very high speed and cuts into flesh very fast. Yes, it does. Yep. I, I've, I, I have a tendency of burning myself on a lot of tools. I've got like many different burning, melting tools and cutters and things like that, and used for wax forms and things of that sort. And yeah, I, I know what it feels like to have your flesh melted and, and, and burned and cut right. and punctured. And after a while, you know, 500 degrees, you know the difference between like a 500 degree burn and a 900 degree burn, that's fun. Yes. So one, one question and one comment. Yes. Um, question, what would you recommend for making masters, if I want to make a, a master of something, say, head-sized or a little bit larger? Ooh. My experience with that, because um, I have done this before, right. um, and I, I feel like I'm still in that experimental stage like with my Princess Leia costume where I'm still going through all these different materials. So far for that, I'm still feeling that the oven bake plate and using an armature. Okay. I mean, I've, I've done the, the, a kiln version. I've actually done the project that I did was do a kiln version with actually the kiln clay, traditional clay, and but you end up running the risk of all sorts of things going on. The oven bake clay is probably going to be the best bet for that. Nowadays, I use the oven bake clay like nine times out of ten for any basic material, but I never use that as my final material. I always use impact resistant. I just bought like another three pounds of that the molding putty because this thing is like freaking amazing. I should marry it, but my husband might be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Okay, awesome. We're done. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, yeah. All these slides will be up in the next Eventually.